Good morning. Don't you enjoy the presence of God? We're going to jump right into the message today because of the, uh, the subject matter that it is. But I want to take a quick moment before we do, before we jump into this uh, subject matter, just to remind everybody, number one, our Coke cans are dwindling every week. But you still have a Coke can up here that is yours to claim. Uh, students, I want to encourage you especially, you can get a Coke can. And how do you get a Coke can? By bringing somebody to church. It's more than a can, it's a trophy. It's, it's something to be proud of. So uh, we've been given, a lot of people have been taking Coke cans. Let's continue that as we invite people to church. And then, as uh, Marsha mentioned, we are raising money for our legacy initiative, which is we're taking care and going to start renovating this space. Right now, we are uh, raising money for new seating in this main auditorium. And we're calling it Save a Seat. Save a Seat. Because the about 20, 24 inches that you are sitting on right now costs about $180. So we are asking everybody to invest in updating your own seat and invest in a seat that is not filled at the moment. And uh, we're going to go over the top and we want this house, this space to be the premier destination in Oklahoma again. Amen? Amen. So let's do that together. All right, so we are on a series. We started last week with uh, Pastor Mari Davis entitled, I Hate Church. Now, about a week or so ago, a a survey was released, and for the first time since 1937, more people do not attend a church than attend a church. And this signifies a dramatic shift in our nation. Well, what I want to do over the next couple of weeks is I want to discuss the reasons that people give for staying away from church. In fact, many people would say that they hate church. Well, we're going to get honest with ourselves as a church. And we're going to look at the reasons and the walls and the barriers that people put up between themselves and church. Philippians chapter 3 verses 8 and 9 says this. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word today. We thank you that it is alive. It is active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit, he's already been moving in our midst. He is here right now. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would help to open our hearts, open our minds so that we can receive your word and be transformed and changed by it. We thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody in the house said, amen. So this morning, we are going to unpack the number one reason that people give, the number one reason that they claim is the reason they hate church. We're going to talk about hypocrisy. We're going to talk about hypocrites. Ah, yes! The old hypocrite argument. Let's talk about it. Let's get real. Let's come face to face with the cancer of hypocrisy in the American church. I'm going to give you the definition of hypocrisy. And as I do, I'm going to ask Daniel to come up. He's going to get ready. He's going to help us with a little illustration here to help us define hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. The definition of hypocrisy is this, not following the practices 
or upholding the standards that one claims to have. I'm going to say that again. Not following the practices or upholding the standards that one claims to have. The second definition is this. Practicing the same behavior one criticizes another for. Oof. I hate hypocrisy. How many of y'all in here hate hypocrisy? Come on, let's raise our hands. It's a safe space. It's, it, it's, ah, it's very distasteful. But my goal, though, this morning is to hopefully break down some of the walls that we put up because of hypocrisy. Because if hypocrisy keeps you away from church and God, I want you to see that hypocrisy is a barrier made out of straw. It doesn't hold up. Let me show you what we're talking about. Now, Daniel, I've asked Daniel to come up here because Daniel, you, I mean, you claim to be a guitar player, right? You would consider yourself a guitar player. Yes, sir. Okay, so Daniel's a guitar player. He's going to play us a few songs. Play us a little lick. Play us a little something this morning. <laughs> Okay, very nice, very good, right? Okay, okay, now let's do this, let's do this. Um, what is that song that, cha la 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 cha that, that one. The brown eyed girl, that one, do you remember that one? That's a classic, play, play that one. Do you know that one? Oh. oh, try it again, try it again. Oh, oh uh, okay, 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 no, no, scratch that, scratch that, okay. Scratch that. Um, all right. You're a guitar player, right? Okay. Uh, how about, ooh, ooh, how about the, the seminal m slow metal classic, Nothing Else Matters by Metallica, circa 1992? I don't know that one. What? The, come on. So close, no matter how far. Couldn't be much more from... You don't know that? Seriously, bro? Uh, okay. Hey, listen, everybody. I want, I want to apologize. Daniel, get off my stage. No, 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 no. Don't laugh. No. No, how dare you? Get off the stage right now. You claim to be a guitar player. You say that you're a guitar player. You make these claims, but yet the second song... You mess up. And the third song you don't even know. Get off my stage. You don't deserve to be on this stage. That is an example of hypocrisy in the American church. Right there. That is an example right there. Because the definition of hypocrisy is that somebody doesn't live up to the standard that they claim to have. You see, when we hold that as an argument for keeping ourselves away from the church, what we are presupposing is that perfection is a prerequisite to get to God or to be a Christian. Everybody in this room would agree that Daniel's a guitar player. And for me to kick him off the stage, for me to tell him he has no place on the stage, that he's not a guitar player simply because he doesn't know every single guitar lick of every single song ever played is ridiculous. Are y'all with me? You follow me on this, the correlation? Yeah, he's a guitar player. Is he the perfect guitar player? No, he's not. But he's still a guitar player. So to, to put the expectation of perfection as the prerequisite to belong to a group of people that we call the church is ridiculous. We need to understand this, that the basis of all hypocrisy is humanity. You all with me? Now let's take this a little further. Let's take this a little further, okay? Um, the church, the question is, is the church filled with hypocrisy? Yeah. Is the church filled with hypocrites? Yes. Because we're all human. Because we are all striving to live to a standard that is beyond ourselves. 
And we need help to do it. We need the presence of God. Do we mess up? Oh, yeah. Do I mess up? Oh, yeah. Is the church full of hypocrites? Yeah. Trust me on this one. I'm a pastor. I pastor a church full of them. See, that's a joke. Come on now. Yeah, God, don't get offended. It's a joke. We're all, me, me included, because we all mess up. Now, let's, let's take this further because the example I, give, I, did, I gave, I did it on purpose because it had nothing to do with the church. In fact, I specifically asked Daniel to play songs that have nothing to do with the church. Playing the guitar is playing the guitar. Could I make the argument that Daniel was a hypocrite guitar player? Yeah, I could. Because we need to understand, because hypocrisy, the basis of hypocrisy is humanity, our world is filled with hypocrisy because our world is filled with humans. You following me? You don't have to go to the church to get hypocrisy. You can go to the ball field to get hypocrisy. You can turn on the news to get hypocrisy. You can turn on the radio to listen to some hypocrites. If we're really looking for it, if that's, if that's the measure, if that's what we're looking for, you can go anywhere and get that. Let me give you, let me give you can I give you an example from the world? Cancel culture is one of the, is, is the, one of the cur- biggest current forms of hypocrisy right now. It is. Come on, y'all. They're, they're trying to cancel Dr. Seuss. Come on. Green eggs and ham. Right? Here, let me give you, let me give you a form of it, okay? This past year, they tried to cancel Baby It's Cold Outside. The last couple of years, they're trying to cancel Baby It's Cold Outside. But yet yesterday on the radio, let me get, I was a fan back in the day of 90s rap and hip hop. Uh, so this one's a little after the 90s, but flipping through the radio channel, Eminem, Rihanna, just going to stand there and watch me burn. That's all right, because I like the way it hurts, okay? That song, many of you don't know that song, that's okay. Ain't nobody talking about canceling that song. Even though in the lyrics, Eminem says that he, what he'd love to do next time to get an argument is tie his wife to the bed and set the house on fire. And, and nobody's saying, nobody's saying we need to cancel this, but we're canceling baby, it's cold outside. Hypocrisy. Y'all with me? Y'all with me? Well, one man's cancel culture is another man's freedom of expression and artistic expression. Come on, people. Come on now. Come on. But the truth that I'm getting to, that I want everybody to see, if we dig a little deeper, hypocrisy is all around us. So, the argument there is since hypocrisy exists in the church, so the argument is, well, that should keep me away from the church. I don't want anything to do with the church. Does, should hypocrisy keep us from living life? No, we still live life. We still live amidst hypocrisy. Let's decon- let's, I want to deconstruct this argument here. Now, this is, part of this is a message specifically uh, geared towards people who don't attend church and who use this argument. Let me talk to you for a moment. Because this argument states, I hate church because it's filled with hypocrites. Or, I'm not going to church because it's full of hypocrites. But this is a faulty argument, and I want to unpack this a little bit. Like I said earlier, yes, the church is full of hypocrites. Where it's full of humans, people who, who try to serve and live for God, but don't, and fail but when we take this argument and put it in the light of day, it doesn't hold weight. And like I said, this argument assumes that perfection is the measure of identity. It assumes that in order to identify with the Father, identify as a follower of the Father, then we must follow him perfectly. What makes a Christian a Christian? What makes someone who attends church a church a tender. Is it perfection? No, it is not. 
Is perfection demanded in order for somebody to place their identity in something or someone? In fact, James 2.10 says to keep the whole law, but to break one portion of it is to be guilty of it all. I'm not perfect, but I'm still his child. I'm still an heir to the kingdom of heaven because my inheritance is not dependent upon my perfection. My inheritance is dependent upon his grace. You don't have to be perfect in order to be his child. See, the church is, if you really think about it, It's one of the few places where imperfection is a prerequisite. (laughs) Not perfection. We tend to think perfection is a prerequisite to be a part of church. No, imperfection is. It is a place where we can come and be imperfect together. And we can strive to serve a perfect God who loves us perfectly together. And I think it's funny, the second point uh, I bring out is that the rejection of church because of, because of hypocrisy in itself is hypocritical. So to stay away from an organization or a place because it's full of hypocrites in itself is hypocritical. Because the basis of all hypocrisy is humanity. We claim to live by a certain code but fall short because we are human So to reject godly community because of hypocrisy is the equivalent of saying, I'm going to break up with you before you break up with me. Right? Because you might hurt me in your humanity being imperfect. So because of that, I'm going to break up with you and I'm going to reject you first. I encourage you. I plead with you. As somebody who's grown up in the church, somebody who's experienced hurt in the church, don't do that. Yeah, there's a potential for hurt in the church, but there's potential for hurt as you walk down the street. There's a potential for hurt anywhere. And I will tell you that despite the pain Despite the hurt that I've experienced in the church, I've experienced some of the greatest grace and beauty and acceptance by the same people. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I'm going to get into that in just a second, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. The third thing that we see here, this argument assumes that behavior is God's goal for mankind. This argument assumes that the reason why Jesus came and died on the cross for you and me is to modify your behavior. Jesus came so you could act perfectly. Jesus came so you could follow the set of rules perfectly. Jesus came so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. He came because you and I could not follow the rules perfectly. We could not fulfill the law. We could not be perfect on our own. So he came and he was perfect so that you and I don't have to be. So that now his grace is the tender of the kingdom of heaven. His grace is the currency of the kingdom of heaven. As we respond to his grace with faith, he pays the price that you and I could not afford. And the church is simply the earthly reflection of this divine exchange. The argument that I stay away from church because it's full of hypocrites, when you look at it, does not hold water. And let me encourage you, if you are making that argument, the only person you're hurting is yourself. That's the only person you're hurting. Because you are cutting off your nose despite your face. You are keeping yourself from so much good, so much joy, so much love, so much life. Because there's the potential of hurt. 
You're keeping yourself from community, from faith, from, from accountability, from friendships. Simply because the church is filled with other humans. Oh, I say, yes, the church is full of hypocrites. You know why? Because the church is full of me. Are you all with me? So let me talk about this. We say that we hate hypocrisy. I want you to know that God hates it too. In fact, Matthew 23, 13 through 18, Jesus gives the seven woes to the Pharisees. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across the sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when, it comes, when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you yourself are. Woe to you, blind guides, who say, if anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by the oath. And he continues on and on. And for me, this is a sobering thought. Why? Because he's talking to the preachers. He's talking to the pastors. His woes are not to normal, you know, everyday people working. It's the people that should know better. And so it causes me to ask myself and to do introspection upon my heart even more. Jesus hates hypocrisy. Now, I've said many times this morning that our world is filled with hypocrisy. Our churches are filled with hypocrisy because they're filled with humans. But let me say this. Now let me talk to the church. Let me talk to those who have attended church a long time, who would consider themselves believers. The existence of hypocrisy doesn't make it okay because that sounds like an excuse. It sounds like a cop-out. Well, it's everywhere, so we might as well just be hypocritical in here too. No, no, no. No, let me, let's talk to us now. As I say in my notes, listen up, church in America. This next bit is for you. Because there are two types of church in America. Two types of churches. There are all kinds of denominations. But when it comes down to it, there are two types of churches in America. Number one, churches who honor God and strive their best to honor God. Number two, churches who don't. That's what it comes down to. Our churches, we're either honoring God or we are not. And that should be a sobering thought for all of us. I'll be very real with you. There are churches in America right now who are meeting this morning right now that are, that are big and thriving and growing and just, just blowing it up. And they're just thriving and growing for a myriad of reasons. None of them which have anything to do with God. There are churches out there that are, that are blown up because they're giving a spectacle to people filled with lights and haze and music video caliber music but when it comes down to it they're putting on a show and not honoring God I want to be a church that honors God now let me talk about the other side of the coin though there are churches out there that would say and lay claim to we honor God with everything. But they're honoring anything but God. Because they're honoring religion. They're honoring a pharisaical spirit. Because they meet people with judgment instead of grace. And they do it under the banner of honoring God. You all with me? Jesus came for people. He came for people first. And we have to be willing as a church, listen to me, we have to be willing as a church to live with the tension. And that's, that's what church is. It's, it's, it's us living, being in the world, not of the world. Living with the tension of I'm in this world 
And there's all kinds of craziness. There's all kinds of problems. There's all kinds of sin. But we want to come and we want to meet people and love people and hold a better way, a higher standard. But at the same time, we're not going to shove it down people's throats. We're not going to, we're not going to judge people for it. We're going to meet them with love and not judgment, but yet not compromise the truth. It's a hard place to go. And there are churches out there that don't do it. Why? Because it's easier. It's easier either to, to completely compromise the gospel and say, hey, do whatever you want. It's fine. We're good. We're just going to party and do whatever. You want. Live how you want as long as you show up. It's easier to live in that world. And then it's easier to live in the world and go, hey, this is, these are the rules. So if you don't look like us, act like us, talk like us, behave like us, and come pre-made as a Christian, then we don't want anything to do with you. We don't want your sin. We don't want your problems. We don't got time for it. We want everybody to look exactly like and be perfect. It's easier to live in those extremes. But we got to be willing in our lives to be okay with the tension. As you can see in the Gospels, Jesus lived with that tension. Philippians 3, 9, to go back to that, says, it talks about two kinds of righteousness. Number one, it talks about righteousness that comes through law. It's dependent upon accomplishment. It's dependent upon achievement. It's reliant upon self. I did this. I'm righteous. I'm good because I did. Look at me. This is a false righteousness. This is the righteousness of the Pharisees. This is the righteousness of hypocrisy. Look at me. Look what I did. Because it all stems from the self. But then there's a righteousness that comes through faith. Righteousness that is predicated upon one fundamental truth, which is I can't do it by myself. I'm righteous because he makes me righteous. I'm righteous because he is righteous. In fact, Romans 5, 11 says, Therefore, since we have been made righteous through his faithfulness, combined with our faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You and I have been made righteous. We don't deserve it. So to claim that we do is hypocrisy. Do you notice the difference here? In fact, I have this as an illustration and, and um, we can't ever, nobody can ever claim Jesus not to have a sense of humor. Um, Don, Don, come here. I want you to say, this is a toothpick, okay? And I did a toothpick just because it's a little easier to see. I want to take this toothpick and Don, just kind of hold it up right there. Hold it up to your eye. Yeah. Hold up to your eye. Jesus gives this example. He says, we talk to other people about the, the toothpick or the speck in their eye. Don, I'm a little worried about your toothpick in your eye. I don't know if you can see it there. But I'm a little concerned, buddy. You need to do something about it. It's dangerous. You're going to hurt yourself. I just don't, I don't know if you see it. I just, listen, I'm trying to come in love. I'm just trying to tell the guys, if you all see Don, just pray for him. He's struggling. He's struggling with a problem with toothpicks. So, Amy, I want you to know. <laughs> She's like, stop it. Do you all get what I'm saying? Thank you, Don, very much. For that. <laughs> This is what I'm talking, this is what I'm getting at. You know, Don, I'm concerned for you because you've not, you're not as far along as I am. You don't have it together like I've got it together, Don. And so I'm going to pray for you, buddy. Hypocrisy is based on humanity. But there is a hypocrisy out there that has no place in the church. 
And that is a hypocrisy that is based upon self-accomplishment. It's based upon ourselves. Because no matter how good you are, you're not good enough. No matter how many rules you follow on your own strength, it's not, it's not enough. And for us to think that somehow just because we've attended longer, that we have gained an extra rung on a ladder and we are higher up than other people is absolutely ludicrous and ridiculous. You and I need to understand that the ground is level at the cross. There is no Jew. There is no Greek. There is no one who is better than another. There is no preference based upon ethnicity or color of your skin or your gender or your background or what education you have. There's none of that. We are all together. And the cure, hear me, for hypocrisy in the American church is honesty. We need to be honest with God and we need to be honest with ourselves. Because, and let's be real. Can I be real? I, I've got to say this. I've got to say this. And I know we're getting low on time, but I've got to say it. Those who have issues with hypocrisy in the American church, it's really, let's be real. Let's call what, let me identify what the real problem is. Our passive aggressive tactics. Come on, American church. Let's, let's just get, let's just do away with passive aggressive tactics. This is what I'm talking about. We, we've got people, let's use our church is an example. We've got people who've, who've been staying away because of COVID and now they're coming back because they've been vaccinated and, and things are opening back up. And so we, we have people in our church who are attending right now, who are sitting in this room right now, who the last time they've been able to attend is several months ago and some even the better part of a year. When you see them, please, please, please. <laughs> Don't greet them with a, well, I'm glad to see you're finally back. Stop it. Stop it. Well, where have you been? If anybody ever greets you with that, where have you been? You just, you know, you turn it right back on them. Where have you been? Because your body's here, but obviously your heart's not. I'm getting real. I'm getting real here. It's getting real. Well, it's good to see you after all this time. Zip it. If it's good to see them after all this time, how come you never called them while they were gone? Listen, dear passive aggressive people, we see right through it. When you add a qualifier to your compliments, they stop being compliments. Oh, you're not that old. I've been getting that lately. Oh, you're not that old. That means I'm old. Thank you so much. Luckily, I'm not getting as much anymore, but it used to be about, yo, you're not that big. Oh, thank you so much. And keep your passive-aggressive comments to yourself. We need more prayer in our church and less passive-aggressive. We're going to go to make shirts. More prayer, less passive-aggressive. Sell them for five dollars. The question isn't is hypocrisy in the church bad? The question uh, isn't is hypocrisy in life bad? The question isn't even is the church full of hypocrisy or if the world is full of hypocrisy? The question each one of us need to ask ourselves is this is the existence of hypocrisy in church enough for us to give up on God? And the answer is a definitive no. No, not even close. Because like I was started to say earlier, I've seen a lot of hurt in the church, but I've seen a lot of beauty in the church. Let me tell you a quick story. My son Garrett, a lot of people don't realize this. We thought we were going to lose him. Um, we thought we were going to miscarry. I'm at church, and my wife calls me in tears. I mean, uh, a, a, a crumpled mess on the floor of the bathroom because she began bleeding and couldn't stop. And was convinced she was in active miscarriage. I'm driving through like downtown Nashville with one of the pastors in the church. I pull over and I kick him out of my car. 
so I could turn around and get, he's like, don't worry about it. I'll call somebody. I'll get a ride. You do what you got to do. So I pulled over downtown Nashville, kicked him out of the car and turned around and headed straight for my home. My wife had called somebody in the church, one of the pastor's wives, who mobilized a group of women to come, women we had never met, hadn't had the opportunity to meet yet. They came, they helped, they got, and my wife went to the hospital. As you can see, Garrett is a healthy, thriving boy, and the Lord took care of us, but I'll never forget coming home after one of the longest days of my life. I walked into our little rental house, and it had been cleaned from top to bottom. They organized a group of women to come, watch our children, and they cleaned the house from top to bottom. People didn't know me. I didn't know, hadn't had a chance to meet yet. Didn't matter. They mobilized and organized and went above and beyond. That is the power of the local church. Hear me. I have never seen, and I love the sport of softball, but I've never seen a softball team rally around somebody and buy a car when somebody's car breaks down. I've never seen that happen. I've never seen a bowling team rally around and replace pipes in a home because they burst. Never seen it. But I've seen it in the local church. I've seen people rally around those who are hurt and when life crashes down at their feet when, when, when my daughter was life flighted from Arkansas to Little Rock Arkansas because we thought we were going to lose her at 48 hours old I did not call my racquetball buddies I called the church that is the beauty of of the local church. Yeah, is it messy? Oh, yeah. Are people, is there the opportunity for hypocrisy? Yeah. Is there a, is there a type of hypocrisy that has no place in the American church? Yeah, and we talked about it. But despite all of its humanity, despite all of its flaws, the local church is God's reflection of his love on this earth. You and I need to belong to this beautiful community because it is the vehicle to which God has chosen to send his message of love and grace and redemption. And you cannot find it at the bingo hall. You cannot find it at trivia night at your local Applebee's. All these groups, Facebook, coming up with groups, trying to create a sense of community. We have had the answer all along. And no amount of social media community will, is ever going to replace the faith community that you can find in the local church. I encourage you. I encourage you. Don't build the straw wall that says the church is full of hypocrites, so I'm never going to go church is full of humans and we're not perfect but we're a family and he wants you to be a part of that family if you're watching online he wants you to be a part of the family of God if everybody would stand to your feet today I'm going to pray this is what we're going to do real, real quickly we already asked this So I'm going to kind of change what I want to pray over. I'm going to pray and then we're going to dismiss. If you're in this place and you say, you know what, Pastor Mark, I want to strengthen. I want to strengthen my relationship to the family of God. 
maybe you're in this place and you don't attend a church regularly and you have used at one time in your life that argument of, you know what, the church is full of hypocrites, so I don't want anything to do with it. I believe the Holy Spirit is breaking that down in your heart today. Maybe you're in this place and you're not as connected to the church as you would like to be. It's time to strengthen those relationships. It's time to strengthen strengthen those bonds. Yeah. It can be messy, but it's worth it. It's worth it. And there's one thing I want to encourage you. If you're in this place and you are fully invested in the family of God, I encourage you, let's be honest with ourselves and let's be honest with God and rely upon the righteousness that comes not from within here, but comes from Him. Because everything that we have is a gift. We don't earn it. It's a gift from God. Would you allow me to pray for you today? Heavenly Father, I pray for every person in this room. I pray for those who would consider themselves far away from you. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring them close and bring them into community here at the church. Lord, I pray for those who have been kind of distant, either because of life or whatever the reason may be. They find themselves not as connected. I pray that they would find community, friendships, loving arms in this church. And Lord, I pray that you would challenge each and every person in this place to be those loving arms, dependent, reliant upon the righteousness that comes from you and not righteousness that comes from within. And I pray that despite our flaws, our humanity, our striving to live towards you, for your standards and messing up, I pray we would be honest with ourselves and honest with you and live in grace and not judgment. We thank you for these things. We glorify you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody in the house said, amen.